Yes, I think it's important to know what has been going on in the past. And I think that's something which is typically for our humans is to know what has hap happened in the past. I think that is one of the big differences between us and animals. Animals do have some memory, but far less than we. We have much more the sense of memory and also the sense of experience, uh, experience things. So by knowing where we come from, who created us, is in a way is very important for us how we deal with our lives and, uh, and how we um, think about the future, the way we should live. Now in the Netherlands we, um, we do have a lot of Christianity and by saying Christianity um, that is not a positive thing. I mean Christianity is the outside, it's religion and I think God is more interested in knowing who I am, uh, how my heart is. Uh, but being a Christian nation uh, is, well, it's, you have an obligation. And uh, in the Netherlands we feel that uh, since we have a lot of churches, uh, I think we should have also a lot of Christian scientists. And that is not always the case. Uh, if you think about uh, biology and geology, um, there are just a few scientists around in the Netherlands who are willing to share um, their creator in science, to, to, uh, to share their, their, uh, their, their beliefs. Um, nevertheless, I will talk a little bit about the situation in the Netherlands, what has been going on, from, uh, especially from the year 2009, which was the uh, Darwinian uh, celebration. And um, a lot of people uh, a lot of Christians intended to make that really of a, a year of witnessing about their faith and it became quite the opposite. So uh, probably something similar have happened here in the United States as well, but we'll see about that. I'll first like to start with a little, um, uh, a little um, <coughs> video which I actually uh, derived here from the United States. And I hope we have sound, so we'll see what, what happens. Yes, we have sound. Wonderful. <laughs> now imagine if we were to have some monkeys here in this audience and they will sneeze. Well, we will all sense this, this feeling of, well, being human. I mean, this is very human-like. Let's see it one more time again. Yes, just at the sense of really... <laughs> so, well, when, when you see a monkey sneezing, uh, I think everyone says, well, he is a bit human-like. This is really, uh, this is opening hearts, and, and that's the way uh, uh, also science is moving out. If, if you look on the internet, for instance, um, uh, for videos on YouTube of Frans de Waal, he's a Dutch uh, scientists very well known uh, about behaviors of apes you will find a number of s very striking videos where you see behavior of apes which is very much like we act uh, as humans so the, there is a strong tendency in science to uh, put uh, humans and apes on the same um, uh, level and, and that of course is by real interest because I think with the whole creation uh, debate it really boils down what is our view on, on hum humanity? What is, what is our view on man? And, and, and there it becomes really critical for me. So for that reason, um, I offer you tomorrow three, three possibilities, creation, evolution, and theistic evolution. And normally when I go out on a lecture in the Netherlands, I will say, well, if we, want, if we would like to interview people, uh, sometimes you are interviewed on the street, what is your opinion about? If you were uh, about to interview people in the Netherlands, creation would not be very popular. Um, um, we're just a small minority. Um, and then evolution, will, you will have somewhat more votes. But then the big, the big uh, votes, the big vote, would be for theistic evolution. And it, it is because in the Netherlands, we still have that remember, re remembrance of the Christian belief. So many people believe in a higher power. And at the same time, they, they think, well, science is also very credible. So let's combine the two and, and, and make, make it happen. And that's 
theistic evolution. Now, we have a, a saying in, in the Netherlands, it's, but it's, it's called polderen, and I'm going to learn you some Dutch, uh, even you, Paul, tomorrow. Yes, mm -hmm. polderen. So say it all together with me, yes? Polderen. Polderen. What, what does it mean, polderen? It means that you uh, do your utmost, your best, to have an agreement with somebody who you disagree with. So that's, uh, if you look at Dutch politics, we have a lot of parties. We don't have the two parties you have, the Republicans and Dem Democrats. We have a lot of parties, and we all have, all, uh, all the time, we have to work in coalition. Even at present, we don't have a government at all. So our parliament is, is it made up uh, the, the, the budgets, past months. And we do that by coalition. So we have to polder. So I ask you to say it again, polder, and I polder. Yes, I polder. You pollered. And we all polder, yes? So that's, that is something which is really uh, on our mind today. So, and when it boils down to this subject, polderen, um, well, the Dutch have come up with their polar model. And let's put a little bit of God and a little bit of science. And, and there we have theistic evolution. And that's the big show going on in the, United, in, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, OK. Now, I present you, I'm going to present you three important persons in the Netherlands, and they happen to be my friends. Uh, I don't agree with them, but I, they are my friends. They are um, Christians, so I, I can pray with them. Uh, I can have um, wine and bread with them, share, share it with them. So that's, that is our, our common ground. But other than that, we disagree on a lot of things. The first person I want to uh, present to you is Professor Case Decker. He is a very famous person. He has uh, hit the covers of Nature, I think, six times. He has done a lot of publications on nanotechnology. He's presently he's going into biophysics. When I first met him, uh, I had, had a vague memory of him. And then it turned out when we spoke, we entered uh, the church, uh, no, our student uh, group, as a student, when, when you enter in, in college, you, you, you can be, become a member of a student community. And we did, did the same introduction. So we sat on our bike, and we had a little camping stuff together um, uh, as students. But uh, from that point on, we never met. And, and after many years, we met again. He was a professor, and I was just a, a tiny little uh, teacher uh, doing some stuff on creation. He was very famous, uh, and I was not. He invited me to write a book together with him. He had invited a number of scientists, about 20 people, on creation. And he, after many years, he uh, became interested in the subject. And he was taking somewhat of an ag agnostic position. So he said, well, I'm, I'm not sure about it, but uh, my maybe ID, ID sounds very, very interesting. And after a year, uh, we all presented our cases. And I had something about geology. Um, after a year, it became, became very clear that he was not longer with me on, on ID. A actually, he was becoming more and more agnostic. And after his third, his fourth book, it was really becoming clear that he chose to be a theistic evolutionist. And that was, of course, a big disappointment for me, because he was very uh, outgoing, and he was using his credibility, his being a successful professor, also in the, in the Christian circle. So he became some sort of an icon. And when he stood up, people ha who had been silent for long ago, for 20 years, because they had not feel very comfortable with creationism, they stood up and jumped on the same bandwagon. And they all had a party at the Darwin, uh, the 2009 year. The guy who jumped on that uh, bandwagon was another friend of mine, Andries Krevel. He is what we would call um, uh, well, a famous host on television like um, um, Dan Rather or whatever, so, so, such a, a very important person. Well, he is a Christian, and he, uh, he's a clever guy. He studied economic, uh, uh, economy and theology. It's what we call in Dutch. You have the salesman and uh, the theologian. Well, he did both. And uh, he is a host of many talk shows. He started as a creationist. He invited me in his programs many times. I've been on Dutch television. Uh, your uh, evangelical broadcast is part of the public system, some sort of HBO. He invited me many times. But 
he became very much impressed by this Professor Case Decker, and he changed, and he is now a theistic evolutionist as well. And furthermore, he even used his um, position, being a journalist, you can invite people, and you can invite people not. You can lead discussions and, and pull the, the discussion to a certain direction. So he was starting to manipulate the discussion, which I very much opposed. Uh, uh, I, was I, I was very dissatisfied with that. Um, the third person I want to introduce you is th the one who actually introduced creationism to the Netherlands. I was a boy of 17 years old when I attended the meetings of Professor Willem O'Neill. He's a geneticist, he's the founder of creationism, but at present he no longer supports his older books on creationism. So um, a friend of mine made all these drawings and uh, here he is on the counter of uh, the second store book uh, trying to sell his books back because he don't want to be out in public any longer. Um, just last month, this bookstore, the Slechte, uh, is being bought by, uh, well, they bought the, the biggest uh, book company in the Netherlands that was uh, bankrupt. So it's the other way around now. So uh, you, I think you make more money with secondhand books in the Netherlands. So that's, that's for sure. But this guy is very influential also, and he's a fine Christian, and I still enjoy very much being with him. Um, but at the same time, he is very uncertain about his position, where he should vote for right now on creationism. So um, this is the present situation. We have really become um, a, a desert in terms of uh, our views. Now, why would one accept theistic evolution? Um, and in my mind, we have two major uh, arguments for choosing. The one is fossil evidence in favor of a common ancestor for humans and other hominids. <coughs> So if there is fossil evidence, and people uh, will tell that there's fossil evidence, then we should accept theistic evolution. The second is, is that is in the field of biology. Um, there are defects, um, and they are at comparable locations of the genome. The genome is all the genetic makeup we have as humans and apes. And uh, that is the evidence of common ancestry, especially when uh, there are um, tiny um, spots where uh, what we call stigma, so where changes have been made, um, and if we can c c have that on the same spot with apes and uh, men, people will tell us that it is a very strong piece of evidence that in the past uh, an ancestor, uh, a common ancestor, has had this um, um, mutation. Now, if we look at those two arguments, uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm very much um, uh, I'm a rational person, so <laughs> being a, a Christian, I will end up with writing. I will, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, give you one verse, which is very important for but. But from nature, I'm very rational, so I like to be convinced by arguments. So if people come up and say, "Well, this is the argument. I find fossils," or "This is the argument. Look at the genome," I will listen to them carefully. I won't make jokes of them because I think science is an important thing. <coughs> now. Uh, the fossils, when I looked into the fossils, and for instance in the Netherlands, this whole discussion is being brought up by theologians. So we have major theologians who will make uh, books and they say, well, we're going to explain you how we're going to deal, going to deal with Adam and with the fall. And I, I, I was thinking to myself, well, hey man, this man is a theologian. What does he know about paleontology? Um, and well, I, I, I couldn't find out. So when I go into paleontology, I do see a story which is not very convincing. At, at, at present, we, do, we have a tree, but they're all nephews and nieces, and the real story is not being found. Actually, one of the oldest hominids which is found, it's uh, a, a fossil called Orrin, and it is uh, supposedly, uh, in, in, in normal geological time, it is six to seven million years old, and it's a femur, so it's part of the leg. And it, this what has been an individual which has been walking upright. So we find in the oldest level fossils which are very human-like. So the situation at present is not very positive for uh, a human evolution. 
So in my mind, if people come up and say, well, uh, evolution has been proved because of the, the fossils, I would say, well, uh, that is not the case. Now, another uh, interesting um, argument uh, which is being used by evolutionists and by theistic evolutionists is uh, the argument of the genome. And of course, um, there is a lot of new data out about the genome. You, there, there's DNA sequencing, and a lot of new data. And there are also Christians writing books like um, uh, this guy, Francis Collins. Yeah, Collins. And he, of course, he came up with the arguments that, uh, that you find these spots which are comparat co comparable on, 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 on man and ape. And the same argument was also used in the Netherlands. Uh, in great, de great detail. So this was the ultimate proof. Now my uh, attitude towards something like this is always is that I would like to have a Christian expert to be looking at those things. So not to have done it by laymen of, or people in other sciences, but to have somebody, a Christian geneticist, a Christian biologist, looking at, at the facts and advise me. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a biologist, but I have not done any practical work in genetics and advised me what is going on there. And luckily, we got one guy in the Netherlands called Peter Borger. He is working not actually in Holland, but in Switzerland, in Basel. And uh, he wrote a book, um, Back to the Origin. And he looked into this whole genome story. And he said, well, if you look at the spots uh, on man and ape, they're chemically both of, this make of the same makeup. And uh, actually, those are spots which are uh, receiving mutations quite a bit. They're called hot spots because of their vulnerabil vulnerability to mut mutation. So um, this can be happened in the past independently, both with, human, uh, with humans and with apes. So that's a different alternative explanation. And uh, he came up with a number of interesting ideas. Uh, one of which is that uh, viruses are, have become have been in the past part of the human genome and became detached. Uh, very interesting. And uh, my uh, advice would be is that you should invite this guy one time. I won't elaborate more, but uh, if he's around, uh, uh, be sure you, uh, you get his lecture because I think he has a very interesting story. So to me, th the big uh, arguments to in favor of why should I have, do I have to choose for theistic evolution my uh, judgment is, no, I don't have to, to, um, to um, um, uh, vote for the, 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 uh, theistic evolution. Um, on the other hand, I could also say, well, you better don't choose for theistic evolution because there are, there are good reasons not to do so. One of them is, um, and I talk with a lot of scientists, and my feeling is, is that theistic evolution is, isn't going to get your position any stronger as a Christian scientist. Whereas theistic evolution is not um, uh, scientifically proven. You can't go into a lab lab laboratory <coughs> and say, well, I'm going to um, present to you the case of theistic evolution. Here, look at my experiment. Well, that's, it, it is, scientists will say, well, uh, we can't see God as a creator, but we can't see theistic, theistic evolution as well. So you have no story in science. So why should you go onto this path? It is not a scientific theory. I uh, discussed this a number of times with scientists. One of them is the former um, um, minister of education, um, and he is a geneticist. He was uh, formerly head of the the best laboratory we, we have in, in the Netherlands on the genetics. And I had the opportunity of a debate with him for a newspaper. And we had a very first debate. Uh, and at the end, we agreed on one thing. And that was that theistic evolution was not an option. Not for him, not for me. So we, we, we agreed. So we could shake hands at the end. So theistic evolution is not accepted by science. My second reason is, is I think we have a conflict if we read the scripture, the Bible, because the way in of the behavior of humans is being explained. I think this is a, a serious problem. Um, if you look, for instance, at Romans 5, you will read, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness 
was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will made righteous. So there's a con direct connection between Adam and Jesus in this chapter. Uh, and if, well, you're probably familiar with it. If you read the whole chapter, uh, it becomes, it will, it's being told over and over again, there's Adam and there's the second Adam. There's Adam as Jesus. So I think we, we're moving into a very dangerous area when uh, one should accept theistic evolution because you will have to ask, uh, you will have to uh, answer questions regarding the historicity of Adam and also about the historicity of the fall. Um, and another example, how important it is to have a clear view on, on the fall is um, this book is being written by a very famous psychologist in the Netherlands. He used to be on television. He is no longer with us anymore. He died. Um, explaining on how we behave, why we got ticket, ticketing for speeding and that sort of thing. Um, but he wrote a book and it's called The Tears of the Crocodile. And in this book he explained that our brains are being composed of several parts which we derived uh, as result of the evolution. So parts of our brains, like the limbic system, were originally reptile-like. And, um, and it, it is, he explained to us, it is a bit, your head is a bit, bit of an orchestra with a lot of uh, music uh, instruments which are not in tune. And uh, uh, it is a big fight in which instrument is uh, being, being heard. So um, actually, when I have a, a problem, uh, for instance, with you, Paul, and I, would, I were to hit you, for instance, I have been excused because my limbic system, uh, uh, there is some dis dis disconnection. But I'm excused because, um, uh, well, I, I, I can't do much about it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm made that way. And so you might as well hit me as well. I don't know. If, but if we have a, a problem, uh, we're all excused at any time, at any time, because our makeup, our origin is not, um, is not okay. Uh, we have had some problems in the past. So if that is your view on human psychology, uh, I think uh, we do live in a bad world. So there's not much hope for us then. And for that reason, I think we should avoid going into that uh, area. Now, the second part of my lecture uh, is about uh, a very practical um, a piece of research which I did uh, many years ago and I'm currently I'm reviving, I'm, I'm uh, trying to, to finish that again. Um, I did part of it together with Clyde Webster, who was also our guest this morning. Um, and it's about some research done in the Olduvai Gorge. And part of my interest is I have uh, my geology training. I was trained as a sedimentologist. And um, I think the area of the human evolution is a very important uh, part of the, the whole debate on creation. So for that reason, I, um, I became interested in, in the Olduvai Gorge. And I start this by, um, uh, by giving a little history about the continent of, of, of Africa. Um, if, if we read the Bible, then there is a point in time when the ark landed on Mount Ararat, wherever that was is, is a question, but it landed and the animals came out. And if you look at the paleo um, uh, bio uh, geography, so the way the animals dispersed over the land, there's a pattern which uh, is very much in favor of uh, some origin of animals coming out of the Middle East. So if you look at, for instance, the way you uh, got your animals in the North uh, America, um, there is a strong theory that they were coming from uh, Asia over the Bering Strait and going south. Um, whereas also for Africa, uh, curiously enough, a number of animal groups came from the north. So we are familiar perhaps with um, uh, the theories out of Africa as, as part of the explanation of our human origin, but in reality many publications are known for the fact that uh, animals came from the north. Actually, Af Africa derived a lot of their animals. For instance, in the Paleocene, three groups immigrated from the north. By the Oligocene, 40 new families appeared. Um, then um, 
The most dramatic faunal upheaval occurred in the late Oligocene, early Miocene. 14 families reported, still present, but 29 new families and 79 new genera make their appearance. And then by Pleistocene uh, time, about 53 new genera appeared, uh, about half it being immigrants from the north, half the products of in situ evolution. That's um, common, uh, well-known facts from, from uh, paleontology. So that's the data out in, in the textbooks. The area which uh, I studied was Tanzania. And Tanzania has been uh, third apart by uh, two big rifts, an eastern and western part. And right on this rift, there is a large volcano called Ngoro Ngoro. And uh, close to that crater, we have this gorge, this Olduvai Gorge. South of it is Letoli. That's the place where we found fossil footsteps uh, being covered by uh, ash. And they are still out there, uh, very well protected right now, so you can't see them. But this is the area uh, of interest. This is the Olduvai Coast, so very close to the Ngoro Goro, a big volcano. And this was the volcano one time. And you must have think about something like Mount St. Helens. Uh, you, that's, that's the volcano you do have in your backyard. But this volcano actually uh, blew so much material that it collapsed and became a caldera. So it became just a ring with a very empty hole in the middle. Um, now, the Olduvai Gorge, uh, there's a little side canyon here, but it's not that big. It's not a Grand Canyon. I mean, it's just, uh, well, of course, it is, it is a gorge, but it's, it's not a Grand Canyon. And it, uh, mostly it looks like something like this. It is covered by vegetation, and you will see a lot of erosion. And that's the first thing you have to bear in mind. Um, this whole sequence is lying on Precambrian. It is, at most, about 100 meters thick. So we don't have any sediments in between. It's just recent history and, 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 and the bare shield underneath. And those rocks are made up of ashes, which are very vulnerable to uh, both uh, chemical, uh, uh, mechanic, and geochemical um, erosion, uh, which you can't see actually in the field. So if you uh, make a hole in the ground because of, the, the, uh, because of your uh, paleontological work, um, it will become easily eroded. The next two or three summers, you will find hardly anything. So that was the first thing we noticed when we came out in the field. Um, now these guys, they were the first ones to uh, go into this gorge. Um, well. And, and it was a, must have been a very special experience because um, it is something like you go out in the field for the first time, somebody comes in the gorge, and the whole gorge, in this case, this was a German professor, Hans Reck, and uh, Professor Leakey. They came into the gorge, and they found all bones on the floor because the soft material, the ashes, was, were eroded, and there were only bones lying on the floor of the gorge. So many, many bones, like this jaw, or this uh, giant tooth from Dinotherium. Um, they were all found on the floor. And uh, um, if we examined those um, bones, it was became clear that we have to deal with giant forms. So there were giant giraffes. Uh, this is a giant pig. This is a saber-toothed uh, lion. A giant baboon, all very big. And, and here we have this small hominid. So this uh, was the data around. Now, if you look at the gorge, uh, this is, I think, the, 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 the best part being preserved, the best section. This is around 70 meters. Uh, you will see that there's a lot of ash, and then at the top there is a red layer. All those beds have uh, got a name, bed 1, bed 2, bed 3, very convenient. So we're looking at bed 1 and bed 2, and here's bed 3. Um, in those beds, uh, fossils are being found, but also hominids. And I'm going to introduce you to the hominids that are being found right now. So this is the first one, Australopithecus boise. Uh, it's um, um, uh, a man-ape, uh, and he's much more like, like a gorilla. Uh, only his upper skull is being found. The, the jaw is uh, made uh, by scientists. Uh, this is a reconstruction of uh, Australopithecus boise uh, as made by Dutch scientists in the museum. The second one is normally known as, oh, this is wrong, I'm sorry, I had the wrong title, Australopithecus habilis. Um, so habilis, um, I've typed in the wrong name, I'm sorry for that. Um, 
Many times these fossils are also referred as Homo habilis, but I uh, think there is, he is connected to the Australopithecines. Uh, a group of scientists is also doing that, so I will call him Australopithecus habilis. Uh, this is uh, the reconstruction of this habilis guy. And then we have Homo erectus, a true homo, true human, uh, also being found, and this is uh, reconstruction of Homo erectus. <coughs> now, uh, first, before the skulls were found, uh, there were many uh, artificial uh, uh, things found, like, uh, these, uh, uh, like these stones here, and uh, we call them uh, culture, so we have the olivon, all the one culture and the Acheulean uh, uh, culture, um, those were present already before the skulls were found. And we do find a number uh, of places where people actually lived, and you see that by, this is a, a ground, uh, uh, this is a, a drawing of the ground, and these are all uh, uh, parts of bones in the ground, and formerly there must have been a little uh, we call it in Dutch a hut, I don't know what's, what's the a tent or something like that made up uh, where people lived. Um, there, there, are all, there are also places known which looks like a big butchery, so here was a dinatherium. Uh, this animal was being butchered by humans and slaughtered and uh, eaten. So there was a lot of human activity around uh, in Olduvire. So this is the situation, these are our main players. Australopithecus boise, Australopithecus habilis, and Homo erectus. Now, this was the situation for 30 years, but in the past 30 years, a lot of fossils are found lower than the, the level we are at this uh, location. So actually, those fossils are older. And many scientists hoped that the gap, which is still presently here between the habilis and the erectus, there's a gap, that those gap was being uh, tainted. The situation is that we find a lot of fossils but no real intermediates. We find nephews and nieces but there's not real the connection. So if one were to ask today where is the transition right now taking place, uh, where is the tra transition going on from uh, uh, man-ape to man, it is actually still at this level. And this level means uh, for in, in geological terms, uh, two million years ago, 1.7 million years ago, that was the time where the transition was made, the so-called evolution between man, ape, and man. So that is really still the point of interest to us. Now this level is being recorded, these sediments, by sediments which we found in the Olduvai Gorge. And these are the main players, Australopithecus boise, which is really a man ape, so it's not of our interest, but this one, ah, well, is this guy, uh, because he is also of a bit of a trash can. Uh, scientists have thrown a lot of bones in his, uh, uh, on his, um, uh, in, in, in it, that might, maybe not habilis, but uh, I think this is a very important uh, group uh, compared with this group, Homo erectus, which were truly humans. So this is the situation. In bed one and two, we find here Australopithecus boise, then a little bit above, there's the habilis group, and then at the same time, uh, we find Homo erectus. So these, these two groups were time equ equivalent. So uh, the first of all, you can't say, well, the one came out of the other because they were living side by side. So we should have found something right here underneath in, in, in the first bed. But we all agree, I think, that these two beds are of interest to us. Uh, if it comes down to human evolution. And, and my interest was what mode of deposition was active during uh, that time? And what, how were these sediments laid down? That was my question. Uh, going out in the field, you experienced a lot of uh, game. And so it was a, a great time working there and experienced the beautiful uh, nature, uh, but also the cruelty of nature. Uh, it, it was quite dangerous uh, going out sometimes. Uh, we saw some very interesting things. Um, what did we do? We made a number of sections. I will explain uh, shortly what a section exactly is. It's not a medical section, uh, but it's something different, a section. We did sampling. Uh, we did some um, uh, lab lab laboratory things on, on the samples. We analysis uh, of the facies, and we did some statistical analysis. Now, if you go out in the field, here's the gorge again. 
And this is a map of the one uh, geologist who worked together with Louis Leakey, who he was well, somewhat the owner of the whole gorge. And I was actually the first um, Christian scientist to be able to do research in that area. So that was quite unique. At that time, uh, there were no uh, secular scientists allowed. The first scientists allowed were actually at the same time. They were from Rutgers University, a uh, group under the name of Blumenschein, was active in that uh, region. But uh, for a long time, there were no scientists allowed in that area. So it was very special for me to have a permit uh, and, and be able to work in this area. And this is the, the, the chart made by Louis Leakey and his uh, colleague uh, Hay, um, and with all the locations they worked. And I use this work also for a reference. So um, here we have uh, the sections. It's, it's a Dutch word section. Um, one, two, three, four, five. We wait five detailed sections going down uh, meter by meter, uh, uh, drawing what you see, but also making samples uh, at each level. And this is the result of that work. So this is how a sedimentary uh, section looked like with uh, the grain sizes, with structures, uh, with paleocurrents, with uh, erosive structures. So this is the way geologists will make a drawing about that. Now, I added a little colors to it because uh, that explains the facies. The facies is um, uh, the environment in which the sediments are laid down. So a facies can be a river or a lake or a delta. And in this case, the blue color is a lake. And I, I will ask you to take note of that because that's important. There was a lake out there, and that lake moved around. So you will see the lake at different levels. It means actually, if you make a drawing, is that the lake moved in time from the west to the east. And how is that? What's the reason for that? Because there is a large depression. Here is our big volcano, the Ngorongoro. And it collapsed, it blew out, but at the same time it lost a lot of material. And here in this area is a depression, so <coughs> actually sediment goes, and also water, to the lowest position. So actually the whole system moved from west to east, going to the lowest place, this depression, which is still currently depression, it's called the Ol Bal Bal um, depression. So that is being also recorded in the sediments. Uh, so in time, the lake was here, and then it moved to the, to the, to, to the east. The lake was important for um, humans and animals because they drank water. They, they, they were in need of water. So a lot of the settlements were around that lake. You will find on the shores of that lake. At present, there are also lakes in, uh, on, the, on the rift. And they, have a uh, they, they, have, they are very characteristic because they are uh, alkyne, because of the uh, uh, the, uh, the chemicals which are at, um, uh, on, 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 the, on the spot. There is a big uh, difference between uh, the seasons. So this, for instance, this is the Olduvai, and uh, this is the crater of Ngorogoro. So this was the volcano once, and we're looking inside the volcano. It's a large, big hole, and we are in the wet season right now, so there's a lot of water. And uh, here we have another picture of it, so there's a lot of water. Um, but in, uh, and that attracts animals, as, as we see here. But when it's dry, the same crater, just a couple of months later, is brownish. And uh, the animals are aiming for water, going to what is left there. Now, this uh, results in an alkyne environment, a saline alkyne environment. And the theory says that this saline alkyne environment then uh, elements are being depleted and enriched. So there is a, a response to that situation. We will call that, that's, that's called uh, paleo soil. So there is soil, the formation of soils. And for instance, silica and aluminium are immobile. So they won't m m move a, a lot, but other elements, they will move a lot. They will respond to that situation. So they are carried away by the water. Overall, we have uh, a profile, a geochemical profile, which is uh, in this picture with a lot of silica, aluminium, calcium, magnesium. Uh, we all looked at those elements and they are being, um, uh, they be, they're being um, uh, viewed in this, uh, uh, I draw them in this graph. Now I will take some time to explain this graph to you since you're not probably familiar with uh, the situation. But here we are at the zero. This is the bottom of the gorge. 
and here we are going up. So this is 70 meters of set sediments, yeah? So this is the start, this is the top. And um, we have two uh, axes, so one, uh, this X is, accounts for the silica and the calcium, and all the other elements, you have to look at this, um, um, uh, this axis. So but there are two different axes. Now what is very strikingly is that there is a period, and I've underlined them with these vertical uh, lines, in which uh, the elements are more or less stable. So they are of the same composition. Not, not, not much is being changing. Whereas the start is, uh, is different, and the end here is also different. Now the start has to do something with the, um, the lake being there at that point in time. So uh, if, if I go back to this graph, you see this is the, uh, the second section, sec and, and I'll, I'll show you just, uh, I'll jo go you I'm going to show you just one, uh, w one of these because it's too complicated uh, to show more. But if, if you look at this one, you will see the lake was at the base, so the lake actually uh, is responsible for um, the changes in the original makeup at that point in time. But you will see also that higher up, there is also a change. And that change is caused by what I would call the type of soil formation one would normally expect to take happen when we have uh, a soil or an amount of sediment for a longer period of time being exposed to air. So actually this is a situation uh, which I would rather uh, uh, expect to have all the way because if you look at those sediments, this is bed one and bed two, that's almost a million years. So there is a lot of time for soil formation during a million years. And I can come only w up with one, one conclusion is that the uh, formation of bed one and two, which is uh, largely uh, uh, bed one and two and a little bit of bed three is here, bed one and two, um, that the uh, rate of accumulation is uh, very high, so high that uh, soil formation didn't have a chance. Whereas it, hit, it had a chance when the lake was around here and it had a chance where time was around here. But this part, actually the part which I'm interested in, bed one and two, that's actually the part where the human evolution should have been recorded. Um, there is evidence that the rate of accum accumulation is too high to record anything because there is no soil formation. Now I think this is important because that tells me something about time, or uh, uh, rather not a uh, time. And um, so, if I if I discuss the whole situation, I see two problems. I think bed one and two don't show any chemical weathering, whereas the other part show clear chemical weathering. So uh, that must mean I have a time problem here. Another problem is is that if you look at the whole sequence. I actually see one cycle, whereas there are many volcanoes. It started with the igneous rocks, which are the base of the whole situation. But then I have um, a bed of unaltered sediments, and then there is a red bed, bed three. That is the first sign of uh, formation of soils. And on top there is a rock which we call carbonatite. And carbonatite is a very hard cap rock, which I had a hard time looking at uh, in the field. But then when I came back, and look at my literature, I found out that the carbonatite is actually the last phase of a dying volcano. So when a volcano stops, it's all empty. There's a little bit of last ashes, which is very calcium uh, rich, and it forms a carbonatite. Now, the carbonatites are only found at the top. So one looks actually at one cycle, whereas if you were at a two million uh, period with a number of outbursts of volcanoes, you, well, I, I, I can't think of having more carbonatites through all those sequences. No, we only find them at the top. Now, <coughs> as soon as you start to question geology, you have to bear in mind it, it's something like a house. If you, if you pull at one at, at the door, uh, another part of the house starts also moving. Uh, you, you have that, they're, they're also they're, they're, you can do games with it, but so as soon as you start questioning um, the, the nature or the, the age of, of the, the ashes and the amount of time, 
you will run into other problems because um, it is all connected to each other. Now, what is, for instance, connected in the old of our situation is a very interesting thing because we have the Eastern Rift system, and that's a rift system which we call it, 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 it is failing, at least at present it is failing, it stopped. And um, it, uh, ha it gave us the opportunity to uh, actually to uh, examine rocks uh, on land. Normally those rocks are in the sea because uh, when the rift is successful it becomes an ocean and you're not able to examine those rocks any longer. But now we are on land still, it's still the situation, so we can ex examine those rocks. And one of the things we can uh, perform on these rocks is paleomagnetism. Paleomagnetism is the science where we try to reconstruct the field of the Earth. And um, we do that by making little samples. And the uh, iron, which is in the sample, is uh, showing uh, is aligning the Earth uh, uh, field at that particular moment. So we can make a history of the Earth magnetic field, its direction and its strength. Now, there's an interesting thing here going on because in um, uh, about 1.7 million years ago, uh, standard geological time, we have a reversal. And that's something which is also known very well known in geology. The uh, magnetic field of the Earth changed many times. And actually, one of the changes, one of those changes, type localities, is Olduvai. Because in Olduvai, there is a change being recorded from, uh, so the North Pole became South Pole, and um, it is called the Olduvai event. Now, if I, I'm going to question the, the speed of accumulation of bed one and two, if, if I were to say, well, let's put a figure of 5,000 years on it, I will run in deep, deep trouble with this uh, uh, chronology and people uh, they won't like me they won't respect me they won't say well you're out of line this is not the situation this is our timetable so if I'm asking questions uh, raising questions about the validity of this uh, age I will immediately uh, have problems with this but to be honest I like those problems because I want a different chronology I, I don't want millions of years I want thousands of years so if I can say well this is I can doubt this age. Uh, maybe I can also question uh, the speed in which those uh, reversals take, took place in the past. So actually, I, I, I would like to have that discussion pretty, pretty much. And uh, interest, 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 uh, much of our interest, um, a number of years, not long ago, there was another publication which of, was of great interest, uh, also from the same region. This is the African Rift. And uh, there was a publication and uh, also research that um, in Ethiopia uh, uh, there was volcanic activity and it opened a 56-kilometer uh, um, long rift to a width of 20 feet, which is about 6 meters in just a few days. So normally things go very slow. So if I were to question uh, the age of the rift system, I also have to deal with, well, can... Uh, rifting be a process which is uh, uh, is, uh, is, is going is is uh, going uh, quicker in the past, and uh, the nice thing is that actually it has been recorded just in a few days six meters. This uh, whole situation was very much welcomed by the geologic community. They say, well, this is our first chance that we actually see uh, the process of breaking up. As geologists, we have never seen actually the start of a rifting, the whole process of how it, how it went. And the way it, had, it, it went was very catastrophic. It was a quick, uh, a, a quick situation uh, in just a few days. So they put monitors on the spot here for the past years and uh, probably will hear more of this situation here. But I think this is of great interest. I won't conclude with a number of quotes just to get your interest because I think there's more out to be researched about uh, radiomatic dates in that area. Hey which was the colleague of Leakey, uh, he brought up a number of problems uh, in dealing with the dating of those uh, tufts. Uh, he has, well, of course, 1.7 is, is a million years is a date he would, is, he would very much like, but there are exceptions like the 5.4 million years. Uh, there are inconsistent results 
ranging from 1.5 to 8.5. Um, they're talking about contamination, but still, uh, we have a big uh, variation here. Uh, bed 2 is far from satisfactory. Uh, all of the tufts are reworked. Um, it, it gave, uh, an experiment gave an age of 72 million years. Um, now, all these things are out in the nature, in literature, and I think it would be very interesting going out there and, and doing some field work again, because there is more uh, questions to be answered at that, that, that part. Um, another uh, striking things here, uh, uh, here are some datings in the gorge, which runs up to 47 million years. Well, remember, it should not exceed 2 million years. So something is going on there. And I think the experts here in this audience, they probably will know what is going on. We, we got some helium inside the, uh, the magma chamber. But I think this is a very nice illustration of that theory. OK, another um, thing, and, and this is the last thing, is about calcretes. Uh, that's um, a type of sediment which is diagenesis. So it's, 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 it is ori originating after the sediment is being deposited. Um, interestingly enough, the authors, they will say, it can take place in just a few thousand years. So, um, and, and there's a scatter. So I think there's a lot of interesting discussion in the rocks in the Olduvai Gorge. And I want to conclude with uh, reading one verse from Hebrew 11. And I think that should be a common, uh, our common ground for all uh, Christian scientists, no matter what opinion you have, is that by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And I think if one questions that that's first, I think you are out of line. I think as Christians, no matter what you believe, we have to confront science with the fact that what we see is not the ultimate explanation how it originated. Thank you for your uh, time. Any comments or questions? I didn't quite understand the correlation between your realization that the entire series of layers really represent one cycle of deposition and the um, rapid, relatively rapid changes in the magnetic polarity of the material in the area. How would you explain the polarity changes? Well, the polarity changes are actually, they don't have to do much with the, much with the sedimentary situation. So, so um, the fact that uh, you have deposition, and on top of that, there is diagenesis. So that's uh, the fact that you, you have soil forming and, and so on. Is, uh, is completely um, um, independent from the magnetic field. The only thing where it comes together is in our geological textbooks, because they, uh, then they are correlated. Um, so, and uh, what I've been saying about um, this, this, well, this one generation thing is that, uh, I'll, I will put a, a graph on it, so it's easier to, just let me. <coughs> just a second. OK, this one, for instance. Now here, you see this is a, a um, schematic uh, overview of the gorge. Now this red layer is the first evidence for f soil formation. So uh, it means that we have a higher content of iron. It's been oxidized. So there's time here. So there's time, definitely. And, and there is also um, uh, water evap evaporated at the surface. So this is real uh, diagenesis, whereas those two beds are really not change much. The only thing which is clear from the nature is, is that the tufts are me mechanically being reworked, but chemically not. Chemically, they're, they're very much intact, so they're, they're not changed much. So, and then afterwards, if you look at the, geo uh, the, the data, uh, uh, the geochemical data of that part, there is definitely evidence of soil, soil formation. So there's a lot of change going on. Now, normally, when this is one million years, and this is one million years, you, 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 you keep asking yourself, well, why don't I see the same type of formation of soils in this part of the sequence as we see at this part? And then there is a lot of evidence that, as, that one could say, well, f finding the carbonates only at the top of the whole sequence, why don't we 
can we re review the whole sequence as a one-time event? So more or less, there's one period of volcanic activity, there was formation, and afterwards it, it finally it, it closed down. And that's a different story than, than, than science will normally give. Did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. You have um, uh, soil formation here at several layers in your, uh, well, first a, a question. The blue line indicates that the Homo habilis skulls go all the way up, or? That is, that is the case. That's what's meant there. Yep. And the red line going down is that the, the, uh, the middle skull is found down through those two layers. That's right. I'm curious about the uh, variety of paleosols here. All, all of which take, a, I presume, some period of time to form. Um, many of these deposits are not um, typical um, water-laid deposits. The lacustrine ones, I guess, wouldn't be. Is this the later stages of the flood, the middle of the flood, the early part of the flood? Where, where does the flood stop and, and um, subsequent to the flood, uh, geology begins? Yep. Well, in my view, uh, there is not, uh, in Africa, we have only patches of sediments which are uh, tested to deal with the tectonics. Where, where there was a uh, depression, sediments were able to accumulate, uh, for instance, in, in the western part. And, in, uh, but at, at where we are right now in Tanzania, we're on, on the bare shield. So there's no sediment to sedimentary record. And you just have the Pliocene and Pleistocene on top of it. So. Um, if you were to ask what type of, what is the situation here, is that we have Africa being eroded during the flood. Africa was the center of Pangaea, so it was probably the source of a lot of sediment. And then at the end of the flood, it became populated again from the north. So for, from that, for that reason, I cited a, n a number of things from the literature where indeed there is good understanding that in paleontology that a number of groups came from the north. So Africa was invaded again by animals, also by humans, and they made their steps in an environment which was quite hostile, which was volcanic, and was able to record uh, their movements by tracks, but also uh, their actions like uh, the butchery and so on. So I think that these are probably have been um, uh, the, 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 well, children or grandchildren or grand grandchildren of Noah. So the descendants of Noah, and of course the animals which were in, in the ark. Does the speed of uh, paleosol formation fit with the time that's available, 4,000 years or Well, uh, inter interestingly enough, the calcretes, which are one of the th slower processes, are being uh, calculated by the, the general community of, uh, by just a few thousand years. So that's interesting. So I think soil formation uh, is not really a problem for us as long as it is not a multiple uh, situation where I, I have a lot of hard grounds on top of each other, a hard ground is a type of soil, then I could have a problem. With, with this situation, I think, uh, because there's a good argument that it is a one-time event with the soil formation on top, uh, I think this is pretty much within the realm of 8,000 years. Yeah, but you don't have that much time. You've got just subsequent to the flood. Can you move the lake around that quickly? Oh, yeah, sure. If you can move, if you can open, uh, uh, a rift zone in a few days, then uh, that, that's, that's not, that should not be a problem. Yeah, I was wondering if we didn't have the biblical record found in Genesis and the chronology, as a scientist, just considering the scientific evidence, what would be your guess about the age of human life? The age of human life. That's a difficult one. I, I, of course, I'm well aware that in, in the Bible there is mentioning of people getting very old. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what can you conclude based on just science, the evidence from science about how old human life is. Yeah. When humans came to be. Well, this, this uh, particular uh, strata is, 
and, and I explained it also to, uh, to you a couple of minutes ago, uh, this is not part of the flood record because um, it is post-flood, in, in my opinion. But it is not really making much uh, of a difference because I think the sediments of the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic are laid down quickly. Uh, as is, these sediments are also being deposited in a, a quite uh, catastrophic, catastrophic environment. So the real issue here is, um, the question is, uh, and I'm, then I'm looking to my enemies, uh, the quote, uh, the evolutionists, and I'm going with them to their, this is their show, and, and I look at their show and I see, well, the sediments in which you find the skulls and in which your show should be recorded, uh, they, they don't have the time that you need because those sediments are laid down too quickly. They fail to show the amount of time. They sh fail to show the amount of erosion. That's the argument here. So if you were to ask me, can you explain what happened with humanity, uh, I will say no because this particular place doesn't have any record of that. And of course that's, of, that's a strange, perhaps a, a strange answer because you're used to the situation where you say, well, East Africa has the story of the human evolution, has the, the story of human origin. In my view, it has none of all. Uh, it, it hasn't had anything because it derived uh, the form from the north and actually, um, uh, so it is the oppo opposite way around. Well, yeah, that, that is very helpful, but uh, I'm not a scientist. So you have to talk to me in terms of uh, s very simple language. You know, but uh, I would like to know, based on what uh, the evidence you found in Africa, how far would you assign the age of human? Uh, did you say that there's no humans remains there? There are human remains. Homo erectus is a truly human. Uh, most uh, Christian scientists, most Christians will agree that Homo erectus as being a truly human uh, in individual. So that one with the blue line going up is yes. a human? Yes. How, what, a, what date would you assign to that? Well, uh, I, will, I will go back to this graph because I think that will explain it a little bit. I'm sorry, I, it's uh, a rather, uh, it's probably the first, okay, okay, this graph. Now, imagine we have the situation where Noah is landed on Mount Ararat, and, and of course we're not sure if present uh, Ararat is, is the current, uh, is, has been Ararat in the past, but let's say th th it was somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, now the animals got out and also the, 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 the his family got out and they all spread over the earth again. So there's a situation where Africa became repopulated again. Um, I think, in my opinion, that was not. Uh, uh, er, that I think that was not more than ten thousand years ago. So between now and ten thousand years, mi maybe eight thousand years. So this continent was totally empty and it became uh, populated again by animals and by humans, and uh, they um, uh, moved along this rift zone while volcanoes were active. So their, uh, their, their journey was actually recorded by the sediments which were active at that time. Um, and, and that is what we find right now. So it is not the recording of the flood. It is the recording of the repopulization of the Earth after the flood. That's my opinion. I'm, not, I'm still not exactly clear, and you have to f pardon me. <laughs> In other the eight or 10,000 years, you get this from the Bible or from strictly from science. From science. Now, um, I think um, if you look at the Bible, my, uh, my instinct says that we're not talking about millions of years, but tens of thousands, th tens of, thousands of years. So that's to, to get a figure. If I look at the way paleosols are forming and in the rate, and if I look at the literature, then I'm also talking about thousands of years. Now, I have not uh, done any research regarding the radiometric dates. They're normally in millions of years, but my research is pretty much about thousands of years. Okay, thank you very much. Before we go on, I will point out that it's now 11.30, and I know some of you have places you have to go, but uh, the rest of you are welcome to stay and ask questions until Tom gets tired. Okay, good.
Okay. Uh, if you could keep the um, the graph up there, the schematic. Um, uh, you don't relate. have to, the formal one. The, the no, this one, the this map. This one. Okay. That'll relate to the question I have. Um, this summer, one of our scientists is going to be joining a group at Israel, so he asked me to um, do a little research to find more information on the Great Rift Valley, which you know is very connected with human evidence down through Africa. And um, if you look, I was just working on this yesterday, if you look at the Great Rift Valley through Palestine, there's a tremendous amount of geological activity going on there. Yeah. And a lot of that seems post-flood because even the scientists will say, well, you know, this is Pleistocene. They yeah. studied the pollen in the sediments and they say it's mm. more cool climate rather than tropical. And they can see these cycles. Now, whether they're cycles or not, they see cycles yeah. that tend to fit some of the deep sea patterns in the glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial. Mm. And so you have a lot of activity. Just for example, north of Sea of Galilee is what was called the Hula Basin. It's no longer a lake. It's a big marshy area. That has 4,000 meters of sediment in it. Mm. And that's surrounded by volcanic rock on both sides, east and west. Um, the Dead Sea has 3,000 meters of just Pleistocene. I might be a little bit of Pliocene, but it's the ancient lake Lisan. Mm. So you have all this activity, and it seems like that is catastrophism. It is. And I'm wondering how do you get the humans and the animals that populate Africa down there in the last, let's say, 8,000 years through this narrow land bridge, are you going to have a second arc take them out into the no. Persian Gulf? Uh, no. uh, another arc? Or yeah. Yeah, that, to me it was just uh, kind of a well, puzzle. Um, uh, you are an ar archaeologist yourself? or? I am not an archaeologist, but I am a librarian. Okay. I read heavily, and I have some training in geology. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, what, one of the things which, to me, uh, it should be very promising, and I've, I've, I perhaps I've told that my, the people at Geoscience s some time ago, is that it would be very promising to, to bring together the disciplines of geology and, and archaeology. Um, one reason, for instance, is I think that within Geoscience Research Institute, there is a very interesting um, uh, thoughts about how to deal with C14 dating. And I'm just curious to know in what uh, way those, those views can be ap uh, applied to uh, the current uh, archaeological uh, chronology. So that's one thing. A second thing is that, yeah, indeed, um, um, geology and archaeology will connect uh, so they, th there, is, there are important processes in geology which take place in bi biblical times. And, and one, one of it is the formation of, um, uh, of, of the rift. Uh, bear in mind that um, it is uh, a rift also with, um, which, w which we would call the strike slip. So actually what, what is happening that is that parts of the, um, the bottom of the continent with a strike slip they don't are attached to either side, so they will just fall down, like somebody who's grabbing on something and, and he's losing his weight so and he's, he's falling down. So the bottom is really sinking down, and by that alone, an incredibly speed of sedimentation. So for that reason, we do find a lot of sediments uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, I agree, it would be only very interesting to bring mm -hmm. together uh, the two disciplines. Just a follow-up question on bringing in archaeology in the picture. The oldest city, uh, walled city in, in the world, is said to be Jericho. It is, with and agri agricultural activity. And it has agriculture from the very first. Um, the radiocarbon, we need probably Paul to enter in the discussion here. Radiocarbon goes back 8,000 years, as I understand it. That's calibrated radiocarbon dates. Mm. Um, so. And then you have the 3,000 meters of Lake Lisan sediments, which are mostly Pleistocene, some Pliocene. 
And, and to put that into an even shorter time frame, even if the 8,000 years isn't valid, let's say that goes back 4,000 years, you still have a lot of uh, sedimentation there to stabilize so that people can uh, migrate. Is that's that's the main land bridge? Well, you should you, you should know? look at the paleo uh, geography uh, and reconstructions because I think there is plenty of opportunity to move around for people. But uh, you have to look into geology to get a clear view of what is possible and what not. Good, yeah, so I agree there. Yeah, let's, okay. Let's look further. Thank you <laughs> for your comments. <laughs> okay. It's two comments. One. The, uh, one of the earliest maps that I've uh, come across shows that the Mediterranean Sea had a lower water level at one time. And there's, in just the Aegean area, about something like 500 or 600, 700 islands that they identify in that map that are now covered underwater yeah. so that uh, there was much easier passage of uh, individuals because of the lower, uh, the lower uh, water level at that time. Yeah. Second thing, on uh, the map that showed these reversals mm -hmm. of the uh, yeah. iron, uh, uh, evidently the pole axis reversing from north to south, I believe is what you're yeah. describing there. Where does, on that, on that graph, where does that volcanic activity sit on that graph? Because I wasn't sure, would you be will, a, able okay. to put that graph back up? Because I was trying to figure out where that uh, caldera formed in relation to that, uh, uh, my the magnetic pole oscillation. And the reason why I was questioning because there is a rift in the Atlantic Ocean, yeah. which is also demonstrating a form of reversal of the uh, magnetic fields back and forth that I've uh, been uh, interested in reading about. And I was wondering where in this uh, is the, uh, this caldera formation? Well, it's actually forming. here, right here. So here, here we do have, uh, this is the whole sequence of olivine. And here we have these reversals. So this, this is just a tiny part of the whole uh, paleomagnetic uh, data. So the whole sequence which goes back into the, into the Jurassic is much larger, uh, much more data. But I'm just displaying here the uppermost two million years of the, the standard geological time frame with the, the, with the uh, reversals being displayed here. So the rift, uh, probably in the rift, the Atlantic uh, rift, these reversals are also recorded, but you can't always access them because they're on the ocean floor. So for that reason, they try to uh, seek for type localities which are easily accessible. And, and that's the reason why we call it here Olduvai. But the same reversal is also recorded in the ocean floor uh, at the uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic Rift. Now, do these, because you have some of the, uh, it appears that some of those reversals uh, lasted for a longer period of time as compared to the others. Yeah. Do those correlate with the, uh, uh, have they been able to identify time periods in the Atlantic floor reversals, do these correlate with those? Um, as far as I know, um, there is not. Um, the only thing w what we can say is that there was a, a, a field, a current field at that time. So if you, uh, if you would ask me what is the time issue with the paleomagnetism, then uh, there are a number of questions we, we still don't know, but in, in generally, much of the, s the scientists don't know actually how a, a reversal is take how, how it takes place. We don't understand that right now. Mm -hmm. There was um, then the second question is: Can it be a time problem for us? So, how much time does it take to get a reversal? Now, there was an interesting publication by two Frenchmen. One of them was Prévost, who and Prévost, I thought. And they uh, were able to demonstrate in a historical basalt uh, uh, deposition that the reversal took place just in 10 or 20 days. But that is the only publication I know of. So uh, in, in short, uh, pa paleomagnetism, we have to deal with it in our uh, new geological time frame. And our main, uh, our, my main questions would be, uh, what is the speed in which reversal takes place? 
and what is the mechanism behind it? That, that would be my questions. So the, the speed of one reversal yep. took place in, they thought, in 10 to 20 days, yep. or a number of reversals in that well, time period, or is, was it just one reversal? It is, no, we know that there are, are hundreds of reversals, so it has taken place lots of times, and it actually it means that the Earth was in, uh, the Earth was having a hard time, I guess, that's my, that's my guess, as would be the case during the flood, but I don't fully understand that right now. Okay, good, thank you. I think we just had a talk by uh, uh, John Baumgartner uh, suggesting that at least some of those reversals were actually the magnetic Feel being staying in place in the Earth's or uh, uh, the Earth's rotation uh, tumbling around, mm. um, in which you could, in case you could have a reversal every 12 hours or so. Okay. Thank you for that. I haven't heard that, but that's uh, f certainly uh, John Baumgartner, being a, a geophysicist, uh, is is uh, capable of bringing up new ideas. Let's put it that way. So he he is uh, he's authorized to do that. Whereas I'm a sedimentologist, I'm just scratching the surface. <laughs> okay. Where do I live? Okay, well, that's a personal question. <laughs> I live in Holland, the Netherlands. And Are you yes, well, I've been here. L let me just briefly tell you my, my story. I was a student, uh, this is my witnessing. Uh, I was uh, uh, studying biology when I ran into a number of questions as a Christian. Uh, I decided to be a Christian at the age of 17. And um, I, I chose for biology because the whole issue of creation very much interested me. I, I heard talks from this Mr. Auerlil. I was all, always also uh, displaying him. And then I went to the university and I ran into a number of questions, especially, especially regarding geology. and. Uh, um, one day I was visiting the uh, headquarters of the Evangelical Broadcast, which were doing a big series on creation at that time, uh, performed by Wil Wilder Smith. I don't know if, if you're familiar with him, Wilder Smith. And I ran into a box with a number of papers, and there was one paper in which a number of questions were asked. And I, I said, well, those are my questions. And I looked at the author, and it was Ariel Roth who wrote the little paper, just a two-piece two papers article, and I said, well, I gotta see this man, I gotta talk with him. And then as a student, I wrote him, and Ariel invited me, so as a student, together with a colleague, another student, we went here, and, and we've been here six weeks, uh, cordially invited by uh, Ariel, and on, I met Clyde, and the others, other folks of geoscience. And I've came a number of times back here, um, and this time I'm coming back because I have a certain mission in the Netherlands, so I, I want to update my, my stuff, my, uh, my data. And um, by doing so, I had the privilege of meeting you and giving a talk here. So that's in short my story. I hope you like Thank it. Thank you. Go. Well, again, we want to thank you very much for coming and for okay. presenting. Good. that I guess we'll close and uh, we'll see those of you who can make it next week uh, when we'll be talking about Galileo.